Now I've walked through a little bit of some more elementary examples. What I'd like to do now is just spend this video covering a little bit of a harder, less familiar example in a lot more detail to hopefully give you some idea of how to get your hands dirty. Uh, for instance, when the rings are infinite, when the rings are less familiar, uh, and where you're not going to be able to just make a Cayley table out of everything that's going on here. So the ring R that I want to take is the polynomial ring uh, with variables uh, in the real numbers. And the ideal I want to take is the ideal generated by x squared plus 1. So what this looks like is it's the set of polynomial multiples of the polynomial x squared plus 1. Or maybe in other words, polynomials where I could factor them and one of the factor terms would be the term x squared plus 1. Now what I need you to recall in order to do this example is that if I have two polynomials, f of x and g of x, and we assume that the polynomial g of x is non-zero, then what I can do is I can divide the polynomial f of x by g of x. And we should have done this at some point in time, perhaps a long time ago, you know, polynomial long division, but I can take polynomials and I can divide them. The way that I really want to say this here, the way that it will be of use to me in this example, is that I have a version of the quotient remainder theorem for polynomials. I can take the polynomial f of x, and I can write it as q of x, g of x, plus r of x, where the degree of r of x is strictly less than the degree of g of x, and this is important. All this really means is I can take the polynomial f of x, I can write it as some multiple of the polynomial g of x, plus something that's left over. Um, and the thing that's left over is going to be smaller, smaller measured by degrees, since we're working inside a polynomial ring, than the thing I'm dividing by, which is the g of x. Um, what this should remind you of is the quotient remainder theorem that we have for regular plain old integers. So for example, if I take 31, which is a number, and 6, which is another number. I could think of my 31 kind of like f of x, and g, the smaller thing, which is 6. Uh, I can take 31 and divide it by 6. It's not going to divide evenly, but I can take 31, and I can write it as 5 times 6 plus 1 left over, right, where 1 is smaller than 6. If I instead wanted to write 31 as 4 times 6 plus 7, then that would be silly, because I could take the 6 from the 7, kind of add it to the q of x, and be left with just the one that's left over. So we've had this quotient remainder theorem, and we've seen it and used it and are comfortable with it when we're talking about numbers. Uh, and although we're less comfortable with it, we should have seen that it's possible to write polynomials in this way. A quotient um, multiple of the polynomial g of x plus a remainder. Um, if you haven't seen it in abstract in an Algebra 2 class in high school, or if it's been a long time or you don't remember that, you should have also seen this appear again in a Calc 2 class when you were learning the method of partial fractions. In order to do partial fractions, you need a proper um, fraction of polynomials, and so sometimes you would have to do this polynomial long division in order to get that remainder term uh, in your partial fractions application. Now, enough of that theory. Let's do it real specifically with this example. Here, what I want to take to be my g of x, the thing I'm dividing by, is my polynomial coming from this, this ideal generated by x squared plus 1, so that polynomial x squared plus 1. What this quotient remainder theorem is telling us is that every polynomial in our polynomial ring can be written as some sort of quotient multiple of x squared plus 1, Again, some polynomial q of x times x squared plus 1, plus an r of x, where the degree of r of x is going to be strictly less than the degree of g of x. Here, my g of x has degree 2. It's a quadratic thing that I'm dividing by. So if my r of x needs to have degree less than that, it has degree 1 or it has degree 0. So in essence, r of x is linear. It's something of the form ax plus b. And what we're going to use this for is we're going to say, hey, look, those things, those q of x times x squared plus 1s, those are elements of my ideal i. They're polynomial multiples of x squared plus 1. And so those are the things that we think of as trivial when we look in the factored ring, r mod i, which is what we want to eventually do. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take any old polynomial in the world, no matter how big it is, if it has degree 507 or degree 8, and we're going to say I can write it as some multiple of x squared plus 1 plus this linear polynomial. And what I really want to do is take that polynomial, possibly a very large degree, and I want to associate it with this polynomial a very small degree, this linear polynomial that pops up in the remainder. And Again, this really is actually quite similar to regular modular arithmetic. The process of doing it is just a little more complicated. So going back to my modular arithmetic example, if I were working in the ring z mod 6z, and I wanted to take a look at a number like 31, which isn't that big, but is big, I don't ever actually think about the number 31. I take 31, I write it as 5 times 6 plus 1 left over, and I think of the 31 as really the one that's left over. And then again, it's not as drastic or as exciting when I pick a number like 31, but if I would have picked a very large number, then the ability to take this very large number and replace it with something much smaller in order to do computations would be very helpful to me. And that's the idea that we're going to exploit as we take a look at this example further. Now that's the really heavy theory. That's the theory behind what we're doing. Now let's actually do it with a specific example to make us feel a little bit more comfortable. So let's take a look at something. Here's a polynomial with real coefficients, 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus 11. And let's figure out what this looks like in the factor ring r mod i. Now we actually have a handful of different ways to do this. The first way that we could do this is we could do as I suggested on the previous page. We could take this polynomial, 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus 11, and I could write it as q of x times x squared plus 1 plus a remainder. So I could figure out what multiple of x squared plus 1 it is, and I could figure out what the remainder is, and that's one way I could figure out whatever the remainder is, that's what this polynomial looks like in r mod i. Now, I didn't even bother to do that because there are some better ways that we could determine what this polynomial looks like. A slightly better way is to maybe try to be a little bit clever, add some things in, subtract some things out, change what this 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus 11 looks like in order to more clearly see what multiple of x squared plus 1 we need uh, for our quotient remainder theorem. So the way that I did that is I said, okay, I'm going to take 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus 11. I'm going to add in a copy of 3x, and then I'm going to subtract it right out so that all I haven't changed it at all, I've just added in a 0, but 0 in a fancy way, 3x plus 3x minus 3x. The benefit of doing that is then when I look at that 3x cubed plus 3x, I can factor out a 3x from that, and I have a multiple of x squared plus 1. So I result in 3x times the quantity x squared plus 1, and then some leftover stuff, 2x squared minus 3x minus 11. A similar trick, so maybe adding in a 2 and subtracting out a 2, allows me to take this 2x squared term and factor out a 2 from it. So I've got here, and once I do that, I wind up with 3x times the quantity x squared plus 1, plus 2 times the quantity x squared plus 1, and each of those things, the 3x times x squared plus 1 and the 2 times x squared plus 1, those are elements of the ideal i. And so there's some, that whole big long expression together is an element of i. And the thing that's left over, the negative 3x minus 13, that's going to be my remainder. That's a linear term. Uh, and so that's what this element looks like in R mod i. Now, that's probably a little bit nicer than doing a polynomial long division. Uh, but it's less straightforward, and so sometimes people don't really like that. Uh, and that's kind of an intermediate method. What I think is actually the best method, the way to really properly think about factor rings, is factor rings are a way of taking some initial ring that was very large and taking the ideal i. And what you're really doing with the ideal i is you're saying, we don't really care about the things that are in i. We care about how things in our big ring how similar they are up to elements of i. So we sort of think of the things inside the ideal i as trivial, as the zero element. So what are the things in i in our example? Well, x squared plus 1 belongs to i in our example, 
So what we're really doing is we're thinking about x squared plus 1 as being exactly the same as 0. Anything that differs from anything else by x squared plus 1 really ought not be considered different at all. If we do this, if we're thinking of x squared plus 1 as being exactly equal to 0, then what we're saying is that x squared is really the same as the number negative 1. And when we think about things this way, this whole process gets a lot faster and a lot easier. If x squared is really the same as negative 1, then when I take 3x cubed plus 2x squared minus 11, I'm going to rewrite it by taking 3x cubed and writing it as 3x times x squared, and instead of x squared, I'm going to write negative 1. And similarly, where I have this plus 2x squared here, I'm going to take the x squared and I'm going to substitute it with negative 1. And when I make those substitutions, I come up with the same answer as I did for the previous part, negative 3x minus 13, but I've come up with it a lot faster than I did in the previous example. Uh, and I really think that this is not only the fastest and easiest way to do computations in this type of factor ring, but also the best way to really think about what's going on in a factor ring. Now it's your turn to get your hands dirty with this slightly harder example. You know, following or choosing any one of the methods that you'd like here, I'd like you to determine what 4x to the 4th minus 9x cubed plus 94 looks like in the factor ring r mod i. And then one step further, take a look at 5x squared minus x plus 1, that whole quantity multiplied by something huge, 9x to the 99th plus 9x to the 9th plus 9, and figure out what that product looks like inside r mod i. And for the last example, I'd really recommend reducing everything first using one of the easier methods and then doing your computations uh, and your foiling after that.